Now when a great musician, a musician who holds all sorts of promise, is cut down in his prime, that's an unfinished story. And we want to know as much as we can about where that music was heading, what that man was like, and what might have happened. Whenever I'd play any of his music for other people, it had the same impact that it had on me. Who is that? Who is that guy? Where did he come from? Who is he? And you tell him, and when you told them the details, they had the same surprise that I initially had. He's from where? He is? He's how old? The knowledge of who he was compounded the kind of euphoria that you felt when you first heard him play. Thomas Chapin. You step out onto the stage and you're all alone and you don't know what's gonna happen. What's great is that you don't know what's gonna happen. And you don't know what you're gonna do. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I like that. He was on that stage playing 110%. And he just couldn't stop. He had no off button. What a player, wow. Pluck can play with speed, incredible dexterity, incredible harmonic knowledge. This unbelievable energy. It was like a dance in a way. It almost looked like a dance sometimes. He is one of the last great creators in music who actually was moving the needle, he was moving the music forward, both a creator and an inspiration. He would play solos and he would be playing so intensely and he'd look around and he'd have this kind of glazed and, and I'd be like, oh man, you're never gonna come in on time and then I'd go like, boom, and he'd be right there. He had a deep understanding and appreciation of the history of jazz. By working so closely with Hampton, being his music, musical director, he bridged the gap between today's world and the old swing bands. Thomas perform, he just was an expressive guy. He, and he was an artist. He looked like an artist. He acted like an artist. He was part of the, the fabric of New York. We were going to go to a film at the public theater, and I was waiting in the lobby, sitting on a chair reading a book. And I look up, and there he is holding three peacock feathers for me. So this was all the uniqueness of this man who's entirely sort of off of your scale of norm. It was the 1950s. My father was a research engineer and we were brought up in middle class suburbs. And this was a very highly educated family. Tom would not have gone to Andover because of any academic reason. I think it was the family tradition. There was a teacher there who saw his flute playing, was impressed, and put a saxophone in his hand and said, try this. In New York during Thomas's time, there were two different camps of music, and people had an idea and an attitude about what music was. They worked really hard to define it. I felt that Thomas was the centerpiece of all of that. There was a schism between the traditional jazz community and the so-called avant-garde or total improvisational jazz community. He would play very freely in a traditional setting and make it work. And he would play very traditional in an avant-garde setting and make it work. There's like a million sounds. There's a million different influences. Thomas was into gamelan music. He was into Southeast Asian sounds and rhythms. He loved Brazilian music. He brought different noises and sounds and instruments and different you know, things to his music and his recordings. I know he plays some wooden flutes on here, pan pipes. He was very fascinated by sounds of, of other types of music well beyond the jazz spectrum. By 90, we were, we were starting to flow and hitting Europe. The trio was still growing, still broadening. Thomas uh, was ready to do a, a big trip to Africa. But by the time I met him in Zanzibar, he 
and just looked under the weather. Just uh, kind of took him to the airport and sent him home. The morning after I got back, his girlfriend called me up and told me the news that he had leukemia. And it was a shock. He had said, I just want to play one last time. That was his wish. I just want to play one last time. It was a powerful thing for somebody to get out of bed knowing they were about to die. And he played. I put his CDs on just because just I'm in the mood and people come up to me and they go, who is that? And I say, that's Thomas Chapin. They go, who is that guy? His music still touches people. The release of Never Let Me Go of Thomas's live performances sounds like it could have been recorded yesterday. It's important that this film is made. It's important for all of us. There needs to be something that honors it, that plants a flag and says, here walks someone that made a difference, musically, artistically, spiritually. Take an individual that's been in the music and you put a microscope and try to comprehensively understand what he did. It lifts all of us. Thank you.